Thank you so much, Steph. Uh, that was a fantastic introduction. And I want to know that too. Who did say that you can't have fun while doing good? Because uh, I have something to say to them. Like, maybe we can sort it out on this panel. <laughs> um, I am I am also really excited about this topic. Thank you, Polygon, for inviting me to mod it. Um, my name's Leah Callum Butler. I'm the director of Emphasis. You might have seen a documentary that we made, which was all about the rise of NFT gaming in the Philippines. Um, and also I write an opinion column for Coindesk. So that's enough about me. Um, just quickly though, I, I did want to share with you, like one of the coolest things about this panel is um, before I got into the Web3 space, uh, I was very much into blockchain for social impact. And I felt like I was really exploring very boring aspects of it, like remittances, for example, like how do we make it faster and cheaper for people to send money home? And, you know, when I got into Web3 gaming, I realized maybe through Web3 and open metaverse, maybe they don't have to leave home at all. Like what, what if you could stay in your country with your family and actually earn an income in your own country? Uh, you know, it, it's a very exciting concept, but we might not get to like really dig into that today, but I just want to share with you why I was so inspired to get into this space in the first place. Now I'd like to hear from our panelists too. We've got Amanpreet, Andrew and Sebastian here today, and uh, they're also in this space. I think uh, one of the things we'd like to unpack today is obviously sustainability from a green perspective, but I think social impact will come into it as well. So guys, before we dig into some of our media questions, maybe you could just give our listeners a little bit of an intro, who you are, where you're working right now, and uh, you know what some of your goals are. Um, Sebastian, do you want to kick us off? Of course. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Glad to be here with you. Um, I'm Sebastian Morgé. I'm the COO and co-founder at The Sandbox. The Sandbox is a decentralized gaming virtual world where anyone can make 3D content as well as games and experiences, own it, monetize it the way they want. Uh, we're really pushing to build this, to contribute building this open metaverse. Uh, I'm sure you heard a lot about the metaverse. <laughs> So I don't want to divert too much today on this topic because that's not the focus. But I want to say like we're very attached as well to create like a positive impact and power players and power uh, users and power creators provide new jobs and make sure that they can benefit them both in the virtual world and in the real world. And I'm sure we'll get to talk a little bit more about that today. Thanks, Seb. That was awesome. Andrew, how about you? Sure. Thanks, uh, Leah. I'm Andrew Robinson. Really um, wonderful to meet everybody and have a chance to hear what everybody's doing in this space. It's a super exciting space. Um, I'm the co-founder and uh, director of uh, Guardians of Earth, which is this new game that's coming out. Our company's actually called EarthGuardians.life. Uh, we're based in Australia. Um, our head office is in the biodiversity capital of the world. That's what I call it, uh, up in uh, far north Queensland. Um, and we're all about um, saving life on Earth, uh, reversing the biodiversity crisis, stopping that uh, through gaming and Web3 gaming. And we've um, basically what we do is build technology that connects people to nature for the purpose of mapping every species of life on the planet um, in order to save it so we create a biodiversity map um, that tells us gives us the data that we need to know whether we are saving uh, life or not um, and the game is called guardians of earth um, and it's going to come out early next year uh, it's a real world game where you go outdoors it's kind of like pokemon go meets david attenborough but uh, really hyped up and uh, really fun. I think it's the whole point of the game is to be as fun as possible to, to engage people and have an impact. Wait, I thought blockchain games aren't fun. Oh, maybe we'll revisit uh, that later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm afraid over to you. Uh, tell us about what you're working on. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leah. And thanks for having me here, guys. Very exciting topic. Uh, my name is Haman, not as experienced as Sebastian and Andrew, but uh, uh, I I I'm, I come from Unilever, so I I am working as a global media lead for Unilever, handling partnerships in passion marketing spaces, which includes the work we do on gaming, metaverse, Web three, sports, entertainment, and music. Uh, uh, I have been an ex professional gamer for my country, so essentially uh, done three three years of professional gaming, and then got into creating a gaming startup. So I've had my share of 
gaming throughout my career and my, my personal and professional life. And now with Unilever, I'm sort of getting to work on the most passion spaces that exist. So win-win for me. It's awesome. Thanks, guys. So let's dive right into it. Um, look, I wanted to just give a little bit of context because we're post-merge now. And I think uh, the conversation about sustainability has changed a little bit in the community. Um, but Sebastian, I think the Sandbox has had like a range of sustainability initiatives for a very long time, if we're counting in crypto years. <laughs> Maybe you could kind of walk us through that. Like, what were you doing sort of a year ago? I mean, I know like, maybe midway through last year, I was learning about things that the Sandbox was doing around carbon credits and uh, you know other sustainability initiatives that I, I'm wondering what it was like then and how are you looking at it now post-merge? Like, has it changed at all? Walk us through it. All right. Well, <laughs> actually our sustainability initiative started even before crypto. Sandbox originally was a mobile game on iOS and Android that launched in 2012. And I was mm. looking into our archive and in 2014, we did a first campaign in partnership with a charity called WeForest, where anyone who bought a virtual tree, a pixel orchid virtual tree, that people just drop a seed plant and the tree was growing on the screen. Like we were like giving money to uh, plant a real world tree that was into the Madagascar mangroves. And I think we planted something like 10,000 uh, mangrove trees back then in Madagascar. It was the first experiment wow. and uh, a, a, a quite successful one which uh, I think was part of our idea, like how do we make that people can create virtual worlds, share sales, and have somehow like also a positive impact. Was a one-off. And then until 2017, 2017, that we start to work on the new version of Sandbox, this time using blockchain and NFTs. We, we kept thinking like, how can we make it that every action like people do in the metaverse will also benefit somehow back into the real world. Around the beginning of 2021, I remember, um, blockchain, NFT came under the media with not such a great positive angle. Like everyone was fighting against saying like we had a, uh, mm. a very negative carbon and ecological impact, NFT were bad, etc. So there was quite of like media trying to like bring those projects and the builders down. And we say, okay, it's time that we reactivate um, what we did back then and we amplify it even more. So we've done a range of actions. First, we announced that we were moving publicly to our polygon, like having our layer two, moving to proof of stake instead of proof of work, or what's been a really important step. The second has been like, uh, we looked at compensating compensating fully all our uh, carbon emissions from the transaction related to like buying land or transacting as assets on the blockchain. So for that, we partnered with uh, Nori.com, which is a platform where you can buy uh, carbon credits. They are directly sourced without intermediary and you get a certificate on chain where you can see the exact parcel in a farm in the US or other part of the world. We we also uh, had a second partner to put like different um, to diversify, and we amplify what we did with VForest as we got back in contact with them and we gave one percent of all the land sale proceeds to support more forest. And I think to date we've planted around one hundred sixty thousand trees around the world in Amazonia, in Madagascar, in uh, uh, Somalia, and not just planted trees from scratch, but also helped existing forests, like cleaning them up and making sure the soil was fertile so those forests could develop in a healthy way, contributing to also like uh, bring jobs to the local communities and delay surrounding those areas. Uh, as all of this is being tracked, reported and monitored thanks to the work of We Forest. I think that was still not enough. So we went into a few more uh, actions, action like we launched a few collectible NFTs, uh, trees that we put in auction and 
we we gave not 100% of the proceeds of the sale, of the sales but 200% because i felt like if we just ask 100% we just put on the user the effort to support but when we give 200% not only the user contribute and feel doing good but also us as a platform the the service operator we uh contribute we make our part we've also supported beyond reforesting and replanting trees we've been foresting uh, i think we acquired an nft from cyber Kongs, one very special nft and all the proceeds of this acquisition went to support uh, a gorilla protection foundation we've done um uh, other activities more recently with the jaguar foundation that is that has an experience in a sandbox alpha season three they launch um an experience into the land, they showcase their NFT, and there is a global awareness being raised as there was an event both in New York, in the physical world, and in the metaverse at the same time. And we want to contribute that, uh, that impact, raising awareness, educating, and making sure that we lead by example. So that's the first thing about sustainability. I think we want to go also to push our social impact toward like more inclusivity, diversity uh, of how people can enter the metaverse, how we make sure that these new opportunities that the metaverse represent and the whole creator economy and even play and earn is accessed not just by always the same population of more privileged first world developed country who have uh, yeah. like, uh, computer access, internet access, education, et cetera. So we put a lot of effort to develop the sandbox community uh, um, in many countries, including in Philippines, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in uh, and other territories, and make sure that uh, the creator economy that's starting to kick off in Sandbox can benefit uh, anyone without any special skills, special education, special background to mm -hmm. become as inclusive and so on. And finally, we supported a collection from uh, people of crypto labs which is like an avatar collection that represent more um lgbtq plus uh population and uh bringing avatars that are non-gendered or not just human women and female men of a woman to create and show that the metaverse is also a chance to start building a world from scratch that is more fair and equal in the gender representation and the, how people perceive each other through their digital identity that is that avatar. I mean, that is super impressive. That's a hard act to follow, I gotta say. <laughs> I mean, Sandbox has been doing some incredible stuff in this space. And I think one of the things that you didn't mention too is that you've also got a partnership with DBS, or at least I think they bought land in the Sandbox as well, which is, you know, an incredible uh, show of legitimacy and credibility for everything that you're doing. So congratulations there. I do want to hear from the other guys. Andrew, I want to throw to you and, you know, maybe you can just walk us through in a bit more detail what you're doing. But from my desktop research, I think you like managed to discover a new species or one that people thought was extinct or something. The thing though, I really want to hear from you too, though, is that I think you're mixing blockchain with other technologies as well, like AR and VR. Walk us through it a little bit. Like, how how important is blockchain in terms of what you're doing? Like, is it is it a mix of tech or is it just blockchain? Hit me. Right, right, right. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so we actually started with something called Quest a Game. This was Web two before the uh, Web three stuff. Uh, Quest a Game is an outdoor gaming app in which people go outdoors and they take pictures of things. And that that was actually really more like the Pokemon Go meets David Attenborough because people were finding stuff. And yes, they were finding new species. So that that's a really cool thing. We find on our system, um, we find a species undescribed by science every two or three days. Um, we've had lots of kids become co-authors of scientific papers based on what they've found. I remember someone from- hey, uh, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, so like someone, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that's really so happening. cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we we it's a it's a huge database. Over three million um, observations and sightings have come through through that prototype of Quest game. So this is before the Guardians of Earth and the Web three um, stuff began. And I, yeah, I remember there was a scientist in. Uh, in Germany who contacted us and said, this is an amazing find of this pygmy grasshopper up in Queensland. Um, you know, can we 
contact the scientist who described it and we found out it was like an 11 year old kid uh so so what's the point Love of what our, tech, what our technology is all about <laughs> is connecting people to nature and we really believe that that's the only way to solve the biodiversity crisis it's not going to be drones it's not going to be sensors or camera traps or satellites it's people and we have to be inspired and motivated to understand nature we can't protect what we don't value and we can don't value what we don't experience um so mm. that's that's really important what we did now so we realized too that it, unlike pokemon go uh, where when you find something, the, the game knows what you've found. The thing with biodiversity and nature conservation is there's not only a time crisis because we're losing species about 150 a day. So we'll lose about eight or, you know, so in this conversation itself. Um, so there's a time crisis. We have to act quickly, but there's also a knowledge crisis. So we only know about 25% of the species that are there, right? So mm. we're losing stuff that we don't even know exists. And these could be extremely valuable species, valuable to humanity. Um, so that mapping and when you find something out in the field using Quest game or coming up with our new Guardians of Earth uh, game, uh, the, the system has to be able to find out what it is and give you information about it. And that's where we co combine what we call collective superintelligence, artificial collective superintelligence, which is a community of experts um, that are on a system called the bioexpertise engine. It's bioexpertise.org. And they give you back the information of what it is, what you found, and how rare it is, what its score is in terms of its biodiversity health value. And through all that data, the point is, is that we're able to then measure, uh, verify, and report on, um, on biodiversity health and we can then wrap it up as an asset value. And as part of this, we began to financialize it early on with Quest again, we were doing this, but we didn't have a way to actually pay people directly through their wallets and you know, make sure that it was all uh, incorruptible and open uh, to everybody. Uh, so that's why we moved to the, uh, to the Web3 and we wrote the white paper in 2018 on this, um, of something called BioToken. So that's what we've released now is, is the BioToken, which is all based on that biodiversity data. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes like too much sense. I mean, you just said we're going to lose eight species in the, in the duration of this conversation. I mean, that's horrifying. And like, maybe we don't even know what they, what they are. Like you just mentioned, that's, that's really, really scary. And one of the things I like about this conversation though, is that you and Seb have both established it in a way that we're thinking about where the virtual meets the tangible or the physical. Um, I think that's the best way to think about the open metaverse and how it becomes real for each and every one of us. Um, and all of you are working on such interesting projects. I feel like we're going to spend most of this discussion just trying to understand it because this is like really like next frontier kind of stuff. Um, and pre, I mean, so in a past life, I worked with Unilever. I like, I know the business quite well in terms of all the different brands. I am so interested to hear from you. Like, I think there's a lot of brands, basically every brand in the world right now wants to make a metaverse play, right? Like everyone wants to be relevant in web three. And people are sort of trying to figure out how do I do that? How do I not come across as corny? <laughs> like, how are you approaching that? Because as you mentioned before, you're a pro gamer. I don't feel like you take this stuff lightly. Walk us through yeah. it. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question because a lot of times when people hear you really were, they can't really make the right connect to what we're doing in the metaverse. So for us, metaverse sort of presents itself as a as a new channel for engaging consumers with our brand stories in a, in a more fun and immersive way so uh, and the way we are looking at metaverse it's a combination of spaces where the consumer engagement will happen right and and as a result it presents another touch point for our brands to be an intrinsic part of their virtual lifestyle just like we are part of their uh, in real lifestyles and in, in, in the daily life and uh, given gaming is the biggest opportunity of scale in the metaverse currently, I think we are building capabilities for our brands to authentically show up, uh, drive their purpose and product messaging in the gaming ecosystem. While just to jump, very jump in, yeah. I'm afraid, I didn't want I didn't want to cut you off, but I was just thinking I kind of took for granted. I mean, I know all of the much loved Unilever brands. It might actually help yeah. if we just let listeners know. Like, so I can think off the top of my head, surf. Lux, yeah. Magnum. Yeah. I mean, like, 
Dove, Sun Silk, yeah. like there's so many amazing Unilever brands. Like people probably yeah. use these in, in their home every single day and they probably don't even know that Unilever makes them. I mean, yeah. these are brands that everyone knows. I, I just kind of thought it would it might be useful to kind of point it out. Maybe you could even share a little bit about the use cases that you've found for these brands in the open yeah. metaverse. Yeah, definitely. So like you said, for example, let's talk about Sun Silk. Sun Silk is the, yep. one of the world's leading hair care brand. So uh, we recently created our experience in Roblox, which is a popular gaming platform, as you would all know, uh, called the Sun Silk City Island. So essentially that that's an experience where we were inviting young girls uh, to play four mini games, which are sort of based on how they can open up possibilities in real world just like their avatars would do in the virtual world. And as part of the process of playing the game, the, the young girls could kind of shape their avatars through cool hairstyles and stuff. So the, the game was loved because it had a product messaging, it had a purpose messaging to it. Similarly, Hellman's, uh, if you know our mayonnaise brands. So we actually partnered with Animal Crossing, uh, the popular game uh, a hmm. few years back where, where we, we, we created a Hellman's Island in Animal Crossing where we're talking about how do we tackle the problem of food waste. So, and we ended up giving more than 100 million uh, like free meals in the community as a part of people playing that game. And if you, if you, if you read the news very recently, we have launched a partnership for our leading brand Dove, where we have announced with the Epic Games and Women in Games that we want to bring the idea of real virtual beauty through uh, education on adequate body representation of female characters in leading games, because it's 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 no hidden secret that the way female characters and the genre, the gender in general is represented in the gaming ecosystem, the game is needed to be changed, and that's what we did with yeah. the recent partnership. And uh, if you had to go like beyond gaming as well, like if, if I if I look at in the general metaverse and Web three terms, then we've sort of worked with. Uh, some uh, virtual decentralized platforms like Decentraland, where we recently activated the Rexona Metathon, the first virtual marathon in the metaverse, where we wanted to drive the message of inclusion in the metaverse, because in general, marathons are designed for people who are fit, can run, but virtually, it's anybody can join in, and that's where we created aesthetics and wheelchairs in Decentraland, where anybody could join and run that marathon. Uh, and similarly for our, our toothpaste brand close up we created a experience in decent land again called the city hall of love because close up is all about bringing couples together couples who are not generally accepted in the society in terms of like lgbtq couples or couples with different races and ethnicities so we wanted to give them a chance to immortalize their love on the blockchain so we enabled them to mint NFT marriage certificates, but, but and just getting married in those virtual worlds. So, in in all, I think uh, if you look at it, our brands uh, have entered the space and are slowly finding ways to bring their purpose and product messaging and life and ways of doing good in the society like we do in the real life. And if you if you look at NFTs in general, because obviously that's the hype word, uh, we are looking at NFT blockchain based tokens as the gateway to design next gen loyalty programs. And that's where I think things become interested because NFTs would help us drive brand communities. And if we're able to drive branded communities, we are able to sort of drive good in the society, which whether it's sustainability, whether it's diversity and inclusion, whether it's gender representation. So it's all about mobilizing the community and kind of helping them talk a same language, which, which our brands do it in the real life, but we're also trying to do in the virtual life. Yeah, I mean, look, honestly, it's pretty forward thinking for Unilever. I mean, I'm not seeing any other FMCG brands kind of doing anything like this. It, was it difficult for you to kind of get people on board with this sort of strategy? Just interested to know, like, if for other brands that might be watching, thinking, how do I get, you know, corporate brands to get excited about Web3 in the metaverse or to think differently? I mean, do you think it was difficult to kind of get them on board? Uh, are you saying internally or externally, like consumers? Oh, good question back. Uh, I guess I was thinking internally, but adoption yeah. is a, a much bigger question, actually. Maybe we should tell me internally, and then I want to ask the adoption question of everyone. <laughs> yeah, I think in general, uh, obviously, the space requires a lot of education and a lot of understanding because, like, 
most like most of the people in the panel here are gamers have been part of the community understand discord and other channels that are usually mm. not hyped about from certain time now so there's obviously a level of education and inspiration and uh, thought leadership that needs to be done internally but uh, like like i think most things in unilever we've been able to kind of mobilize the, the right kind of resources the right kind of education materials to help uh, train our next line of brand manager on, on this and i think that this has worked well which is obviously shown by the level of activations we have been doing in the last few months so the internal the internal education and inspiration has been has been a very good and a positive rewarding effort for us so and externally around adoption i think we have seen some tremendous response to our experiences uh, the numbers speak for itself so i think in general we are a company that uh, obviously deals in mass consumer products so that's the way forward adoption will sort of help us drive more and more experiences like these mm. Hey Seb, maybe you could talk a little bit to that. Like maybe even with your Blockchain Game Alliance hat on. So Seb is also the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance. I think over the last year, we've seen a lot of pushback against NFTs because people were worried about their environmental impact. Um, and that was, you know, one of the number one reasons why people said they didn't want to adopt the technology. But more and more with education and exposure, we're seeing that that's kind of you know, not really a valid pushback against the space. So what are you seeing in terms of adoption? Like, do you think with greater education and understanding around the sustainability aspects of blockchain, we're going to see greater adoption because people don't feel so worried about it being, you know, a threat to the environment? I, I think that we've definitely seen over the past year or two years, like a shift of, um, of mind and opinion around the topic. It's been essentially driven by like the rising growth of uh, new blockchains. Like I will call them like second generation blockchains that are all proof of stake. So whether you think Tezos, Solana, and Polygon, obviously, which is like representing now a larger portion of the overall ecosystem, all of them are proof of stake based and have done a great job at like promoting like the green aspects of um, by, by, their protocol and, and the lack of like impact they have on the environment, plus like the various initiatives that they had on their own and uh, the different application and services being built upon them. Some of them you find as a member of the Blockchain Game Alliance, obviously. Uh, we're seeing as well at the Sandbox level, a growing number of brands uh, and institutions, like you mentioned GBS before, but we had also like Standard Chartered Bank, we had uh, AXA, we, we had HSBC, we had a good number of, of uh, projects that are promoting the use of those virtual worlds and those virtual space to educate audiences about uh, like more sustainable initiatives um, and uh, both within their corporation, their group, for their own employees, but also to the rest of the world, like for their and their own consumer users and so on. And so there, people are seeing those platforms, both Sandbox, Metaverse, or the member of the Blockchain Game Alliance as vehicles to convey a message, to reach an audience that is, uh, we know like people who own crypto in this world tend to be influential. They tend to have a certain access to a certain um, uh, reach through the power of community, through the power of DAOs, et cetera, as well. So they can help amplify the message. And we know like crypto is global. And uh, if you look at the top countries where there is crypto adoption, they are not just only US, Europe, uh, Korea, or Japan. Actually, there are uh, a great number of countries in Africa, a great number of countries in Southeast Asia, or in Latin America, where you've been. So all those world that progressively also um, are, are adopting crypto and adopting those new behaviors, keeping um, in the way uh, the bad habits that we that have been built over the years in the more developed countries. And that's an interesting prospect, I think, like how there is a, a whole movement going on in general, thanks to that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Andrew, what are you seeing in your corner of the world in terms of adoption? Like, I I'm interested to know because you seem like a person who is very driven by the do good like you know i want to build something that is going to impact the world positively but you also kind of understand that 
if it's not a fun game, like people aren't going to play it. So how are you seeing that from a, an adoption perspective? Do people just play it because it's fun or do they play it because they understand the purpose? Um, so we have the Quest game web two game out there that's played globally and people enjoy it probably because it gets them outdoors and it's, and it's fun and they like the, the points and, and they like the competition part of it. They like competing against other people to see who can find the coolest stuff and build their collection. And I think that's where the, the adoption became really powerful for us in Web3 is that people had these collections. And what we are saying is what you've collected mm. is actually really valuable data. So we can NFT that, we can bring that over to the Web3 space, we can financialize it for you. It's your data, you get to do with it what you want. And that is has weird. bring that has been, yeah right. It's not it's not just being taken <laughs> from the, uh, yeah. the money off of, uh, but it actually is is and then that motivates people to find uh, better, more valuable stuff and um, and and get involved. So they, you know, get a wallet. So we have all these quest game people who really had no idea of this, about the space, and, and just exactly what you're saying. The minute they. Um, they heard the word NFT, a lot of them panicked and, you know, they mm. heard the environmental space. Uh, but then when, as we explained it and we showed them why that this is so valuable, it, it worked out pretty well. So we've had a lot of them migrating over and that, that seems to be working well, but I think you're right. It's, it's ultimately the fun aspect of the game. That's going to bring in the, the crypto natives. Definitely. Hey, we've only got like two and a half minutes left. So I've got a little bit of a wild card question for you. Um, so post COVID, I think one of the things that has become really obvious that, uh, travel had a very big impact on the world. Um, but people still have that desire to travel. I'd be really interested to know from you guys, because you are really, um, pushing forward the idea of the open metaverse and the kind of experiences that people can have without leaving their home. I'd love to know what you think are, you know, maybe, you know, a pro and a con of, the open metaverse, if you were to never leave your home, like, do you think it will actually kind of have an impact on whether people choose to travel or not? You've only got 30 seconds. Andrew, you go first. Oh no, Sebastian's got his unmute. You go first, Seb. <laughs> and then right. you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I do think so. Like we're creating this new digital nation with frontier that is both global and local. We bring culture from many regions of the world, whether it's Singapore, Korea, Turkey, Dubai, Brazil, France, Brittany, etc. So it's, it's quite interesting, and we have landmarks, we have monuments, we have museum, we have art gallery. All yeah, of you that have a Philippines in the, in the sandbox, don't of you? Course. Like a whole Philippines, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can access that culture from anywhere in the world without having to travel, or just because you can travel, and that's what uh, most of the population can travel still. And I think it's great to broaden, like how many million people can visit those landmarks, know, learn, discover, and one day maybe they will visit that place in the physical world. I love that. It's, it's a new way to research where you're going to go next. I guess your approach is a little bit different, Andrew. Tell me what you think. Like, is it going to impact people's travel habits? I definitely think so. I, I think that part of the excitement is the discovery of new um, ecosystems, new uh, species, mm. new you want to do this, we're involving a lot of eco resorts now, which is a big thing. So the sort of nature lifestyle, people who actually go to a place to, to discover the biodiversity there. In the virtual world, mm. you can teleport, but in the real world, you can actually go and discover nature anywhere. So yeah. I love that. Last word, Amin Preet, tell us what do you think? Yeah, I think for me, uh, the way I would like to look at metaverse, it's like it's a digital twin of a physical reality. It's not a substitute of your virtual world. It's a uh, real world. It's like stuff. An expansion. That, it's it's like stuff that exists together with you. Okay. And if, if, if you had to ask me, I would personally say that these coexist. One can't replace the other, but the whole digital aspect of things would be the best, best to go forward with. I love that. There's so many different perspectives on that. Guys, thank you so much. I've got to throw thank back you. to our amazing moderator now, but thank you for having me. This has been awesome. I could have talked to you guys for hours. <laughs> well, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You, Leo. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.